Mr. Mark Selby, how are you, sir? I am very, very good. Another week here in Nickel Land. Nickel Heaven. All good. Exactly. There we are. Have you been up to Timmins recently? Is that, is that something no. to do? No, no. With we have a provincial lockdown that prohibits travel between regions in the country. So I am uh, been largely confined to my house, uh, Costco, and a little grocery shopping. So that's that's. Uh, Costco. Do you go to Costco? And another Costco. day, another day good? lockdown paradise. Is Costco any good? Because I, I someone signed me up for it. I, I went on the website. This is useful information for all guys. All right, there's all good information yeah. here. Okay. I didn't buy a canoe or anything, but there's some really random stuff on there. But the pricing is not all that. I am not sure it's the cheapest. Oh God, no, 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 no. They are the they are the masters. There is a bunch of stuff that is very cheap. You know, a lot of the staples that people price compare, but they are the masters of creating the impulse buy, um, which is not you know, which has a huge margin on it. So. As long as they can entice you into a few um, impulse buys, then they they print money, which is which is you they, know why they're they, they did that whole kind of business. So as my I, wife came home with the shredder, right? Day, so. I I went for some like I just love those stores. You can spend all day wandering around those stores because there's things that you didn't know you needed in there. That, that's right. you're indicating, right? Um, yep. I'm not even sure when they to buy anything in particular, but I think it was on the pretense of maybe dishwasher tablets. Right? Ah, that's yeah. always a good one, right? Let's go yes. and buy one thousand dishwasher tablets enough to see us uh, for the next three years. Okay, so that was the plan. I think yeah. I came back with an eight-man tent, no dishwasher tablets. Uh, yep, Costco the, mission accomplished. There you go. Tick. I am, I am literally their perfect customer. Money, no idea. There you go. Yep. Never used it. Never but you could, that. but you could, and you know it's there. So you're, you know, if the mood strikes to invite six of your closest friends on a camping trip, you're all ready. I, so I like that. Idea. I saw. Sorry, so this is not nickel yet. We're well, getting onto the nickel, but I saw an inflatable tent, so a tent that you could put oh. in the water, and it's completely inflatable. It's, it's basically like an inflatable boat, but with walls and a, and a, and a roof. Uh, yeah, which were all inflatable too. So I thought that that that'd be an interesting way to die, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's re it, it's it, it's it, well, yeah, it's a great concept until that it, you know that leak does emerge at some point in time, and you know hopefully it's while you're close to shore, but probably won't happen while you're too close to shore. Well, th this one had a wonderful image of it on a river, a flowing river. I ah. just thought <laughs> you sort of maybe tie yourself up to a branch at night or something. It comes loose, and you sort of find yourself sort of one of those sort of you know bad sort of cartoons where you're sort of going over the Niagara Falls at some point. But yeah, that's what I imagined. But anyway, so Costco. It just it, it makes me smile when I think of Costco because of the utter garbage I buy from there. There we go. Uh, should we talk nickel? There we go. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. So how right. how's, how's the world of nickel this week? Another, we got back through eight dollars a pound. So you know, again, we hit the had the big Ching Shan drubbing uh, now two months ago. Um, prices have gone back up through eight dollars a pound, or about eight ten, eight to fifteen a pound. So getting closer to eighteen thousand uh, dollars a ton. And again, it's a whole you know the macro folks that had sort of gone away for a while uh, are now you know back in the story in terms of you know more inflation, commodities moving higher. So you know aluminum's ripping, copper's ripping, copper's back up you know over ten thousand uh, dollars a ton, four fifty a pound. Um, so getting within you know within a a, a few more cents of the all time high uh, for copper, and then there are people calling that you know it's going to blow through that in the next next 12 months. So, you know, we'll, we'll see how we go. Uh, again, talking to some of the people on the physical side of the business, you know, uh, on the nickel, it's, you know, the de demands there. They're, again, cleaning out the inventories of the high purity metal that they had at the end of last year. Um, um, you know, products flowing. And, and again, one of the good ways uh, that the physical um, side of the business, you know, gets some sense of, of where the real demand is, is, you know, a lot of contracts, they'll have a, a, a range. So there, there's a minimum, min max, in terms of volume that they can take. And, you know, there's people who are, 
you know, a lot more of the people are taking, you know, closer to the max volume than the, uh, than the average. Uh, so yeah, so it's a good sign from the physical side, you know, and again, seeing some pretty decent physical demand from the, the brat battery side of the business, you know, people looking for briquettes to dissolve, but uh, there are not many of those to be had. So No, we talked about that last week. Actually. Um, I'm kind of intrigued by, obviously, we talked a little bit about the US um, last week and their, you know, $4 trillion uh, plan, which obviously has got to get voted through, et cetera. But, you know, let's assume some, most, some, uh, you know, a bit of that gets through. That's uh, a lot of money flowing to the, the the common man for infrastructure on infrastructure projects and the like in the US. We also saw Yellen's speech um, this week. What, what's again our man in North America? You're going to keep it nice and broad. What's your yeah. take on the on the Yellen speech? Well, you there, you you get at this kind of a uh, tipping point in terms of uh, uh, you know every sort of re, every economic rebound where. It gets a, it, you know, opinion gets a little bipolar. It's okay, you know, we're seeing this strong, tremendous growth, which is going to be great for profitability. Stock market's high. It's okay. All this extra, you know, this growth and profitability is going to, you know, push the market higher. Or you get the flip side of, oh, okay, it's starting to create inflationary pressures. Interest rates are going to rise. If interest rates rise, that's, you know, the market's going to tank. So, you know, we're in this kind of a seesaw battle right now where, you know, I think, and we'll we'll see the seesawing for the next three or four months uh, at least. You know, until we see sort of a clear narrative that yes, we can you know get this big bump in in, in growth and profitability without a lot of inflationary pressures, or like holy shit, you know, you know, <laughs> we are actually seeing inflation sort of spill out into a broader part of uh, you know the investor base, and interest rates are going to have to you know, start to move higher from, you know, close to close to zero in most markets. So, you know, Yellen was kind of hinting at, you know, who's been fairly dovish, you know, through most of her central banking career, um, you know, that, you know, there, there are some inflationary risks lurking around and that kind of, you know, gave the uh, uh, market a kick in the teeth in the, in the early part of this week. Uh, but again, it's, it's going to be this seesaw battle back and forth uh, for the next few months here. Yeah. I mean, a kick, a kick in the teeth is, is, is right. Um, when it when it comes, I don't. No one's yeah. arguing if it's, it's a case of when and getting that timing right. We're, we've kind of got this narrative going on. A lot of conversations that we're having on the board about, um, you know, the the momentum plays of last year, the promotional plays of last year. Right? People taking advantage of the momentum to go and get finance on projects, which perhaps may not have otherwise been able to. And that spilled over a little bit into this year. And you're seeing the same thing with with copper. And nickel pricing um, in the market affecting the way people perceive a company's ability to do economic business. Little things, little yeah. things like make money. <laughs> little things. Yeah. Oh no. And 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 again, you you saw the Chinese government sort of you know a big piece of news that's transpired in the past yeah. week is you know they they pull back a bunch of tax rebates on steel products. And I know that sounds a little esoteric <laughs> for you know. Uh, uh, for some people, but it, it is it is pretty important. It signals a couple of key things. So one is, you know, um, you know what they're trying to do is uh, again kind of dampen demand for iron ore because now steel makers and stainless steel makers um, can't export a bunch of their products, you know, out of the country. So they're going to be less likely to buy that marginal ton uh, of iron ore and 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 continue to push prices higher. The second piece is, you know, this is the the sort of the second major move sort of downstream where the, again, the Chinese made their first big move about, geez, it was probably 10 or 12 years ago where they, they uh, eliminated, not only eliminated the tax rebate, but then they had put export duties on various products. And again, what the Chinese don't want to happen is, you know, uh, they bring in a raw material Uh, create a lot of use up a lot of air and water, create a lot of pollution, and then export that to a third country who has the benefit of of using that downstream product. And so, you know, this um, you know this uh, re- t- elimination of the tax rebate, you know, means you're going to see a lot less you know ch- Chinese exports of various steel products, various stainless steel products, which should mean you see you know a, a bigger demand pop um, from the rest of the world as as they fill the gap you know by those exports. Uh, you know, pulling back. So, um, and again, I think sort of helps play into, you know, the narrative again, you know, sort of argued against the class one versus class two narrative for quite a while. Again, I think the, the bigger narrative going forward is going to be sort of a, you know, sort of China, India, you know, willing, 
to have higher levels of pollution versus Western world supply chain with, you know, with less tolerant of, of you know, uh, carbon environmental footprint of the materials that are being used. So, I mean, when talk, talking of China and, you know, it, its footprint um, globally, you know, uh, China's Lijent has, uh, is that, am I saying that right? Lijent? I think so. Yep. Okay. I don't know. Okay. Lijent. They've started trial mm-hmm. productions um, in Indonesia. Is that yep. right? Yeah. I, yeah. Um, so the first, the, these are the first wave of the HPAL project. So right. back in 2018, there was, uh, when when Ching Shan talked the market down the first time, it was about, you know, they were going to have 150 to 200,000 tons of HPAL projects online by now, um, you know, and then with the capacity to do, to do, you know, many, many more, and they were going to do it at half the capital cost uh, of, you know, how Western companies could do it. So, um, they're all about a year, year and a half late. Um, so they've started production. So the tricky part with eight projects isn't necessarily getting them started, you know, although that tends to take longer and more money. Um, it's actually getting up to capacity, you know, so, uh, so it's good, good. They've got this far. So sort of we'll see sort of how quickly they climb up the ramp up curve. Uh, again, sort of past Chinese experience, uh, you know, in, uh, in PNG with Ramu, uh, you know that took four or five years uh, for CMCC uh, to ramp up, and, and again, this was a place where they basically built, a, you know, sort of a little Chinese beachhead on the north shore of of PNG, mm-hmm. and, and you know, even in that environment, you know, it still took them four to five years to, to you know, get up to the plate capacity, uh, which they are now. But uh, yeah, so you know that that's going to be the next sort of hurdle that these plants are going to going to have to get past. Well, I, I think a lot of eyes on that. A lot of eyes on that, and sort of see what the, yeah. the numbers look like. Because you know, we we talked about you know value being destroyed, uh, costs, you know, capex, etc. Around this topic, um, it, it, I get, and I guess because of the nature of the the participants, it's going to be hard to get that information, and it's going to have to work it out. And it'll be a long time before we see what's actually happened. So it doesn't it doesn't help per se, does it? Or is there some way of deciphering it? No, no, it's, yeah, at this point, it's sort of, uh, okay, that's good. And we'll see where we go from here. I mean, the, the other news this week was, again, in terms of the alternative, in terms of getting nickel cobalt into the battery sector is around producing that, um, which was the Ching Shan announcement from a few months ago. So nickel mines, you know, who's joint ventured with Ching Shan in a few places has now signed up um, to start producing a, a portion of their production as mat uh, as well. So again, I think, um, you know, over the next six months or so, you'll see, you'll see a bunch uh, more projects, more producers talk about producing that. Because again, the, just the whole capital investment slash risk slash return um, is 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 pretty heavily weighted to just producing that, as opposed to you know going through all the grief and and trouble with HPAL. Unless you know miraculously these things do ramp up much more quickly um, than than projects have in the past. Well, a big told you so moment. Won't it? Yeah. For some yep. people. We'll see For what some happens people. There. Yep. For some we'll people. See what happens. Did you see, I don't know if you saw this this week, uh, that cargo ship that ran aground in the Philippines? See that story? Yeah. Yeah. No, the, one of the unfortunate parts with with shipping laterite ore, uh, thankfully, it, it happens very rarely now. But back when nickel pig iron got going in 2005, um, there was a, a number of ships that this happened to. Uh, Laterite ore um, has contains about thirty percent moisture, um, and and if it's a few percentage points above that in rough seas, it actually liquefies. Um, and boats aren't very good with sloshing things inside unless they've been specially designed um, for that. Um, and so these things capsize. And so yeah, so the boat capsized, crew was gone, and the boat washed up on uh, yeah. shore in the Philippines. So. Um, it's just, you know, again, sort of a, uh, a tricky part of the business. And again, just to underscore the fact that, you know, that this, when I talk about laterite ore being soggy dirt, you know, it is really soggy dirt. Yeah, no, I know. We, we, we experienced that with iron ore back in the sort of early 2000s, well, no, late 2000s, actually, um, with iron ore fines, which have the same thing. They kind of liquefy that, but they literally become almost like water in the boat, creates yeah. huge swings and sways. And, and you imagine in the, in, with big uh, waves, um, troughs and waves, you're, you're in a whole world of hurt and pain there. But and they they kind of they they kind of the amusing. Sorry, they're similar, not quite the same. But we had yeah. this. We 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 made a sizable investment in, in lignite 
which is a kind ah. of brown, brown coal, brown coal. Yep. And I, I'm going to go somewhere, something I'm going to get, they're going to get slightly wrong. It was, I think the, the actual company was in Greece, mm -hmm. Northwest Greece, and they were trying to, the, the actual asset was, I can't remember which country, slightly further Northwest, Lignite, shipped back down to Greece, great, nice, cheap energy uh, source for them. But the trouble with lignite is filled with gas, very gassy little thing. And you you, st you stick that on a train in large quantities, large quantities of gas build up. There are the odd moments where these things just explode. So we during the course of this investment of ours, I think there were three trains blew wow. up. It's good wow. effort, I thought. Wow. Hopefully not in highly populated areas and it happens no, in no. less populated areas. But yeah. That was, nope. uh, you know, the, the transportation component to all of this is, of all of these commodities is, is kind of, we haven't really, we've looked at sort of tankers a little bit in, in the club, but. Uh, right. The, it's just occasion, occasional horrific stories which have just gone exceedingly well right up to the point you deliver whatever it is you're delivering. So it's quite, quite good to actually outsource that component. Exactly. Do a it's third nice. party. Third party. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. We said we talk a bit of company news this week, didn't we? Because we did a lot of yes. macro last week, which was cool. So uh, who's first on your list? Who do we need to talk about? Yeah. So, so you know, the key thing is here, again, we're sort of moving along in, in the, 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 you know, nickel as, as a favored metal here. So not surprisingly, you're starting to see a bunch of new stories pop up where people are talking about, oh, We've picked up a new property. We've started doing geophysics. We've got a bunch of really exciting anomalies, um, and we're going to be drilling soon. You know, and again, the key is is uh, you know, so so things to look at is you know, have these people actually ever discovered every anything in their past, or have they just run companies that haven't really delivered anything and just suck cash out of shareholders' pockets, right? So because you're going to get some of those guys there, you know, two. Is that property since been something they, they they will spin it as new, and you're going to have to read into the detail to see, you know, you know, was it actually been explored three or four times, and they're just looking at it um, for the fifth time, and this time, hopefully, fifth time lucky, you know, they're going to find some nickel other than you know um, one of the other companies. That, and again, that does happen. I, I shouldn't say you know that should automatically dismiss it, but um, unless they have a really new angle or a new piece of technology. Um, you know, um, if it was last explored in the 70s and, and you know, they think there's some deep EM, like EM targets at depth, okay, that's technology that's advanced pretty dramatically. But if they looked at it seven years ago and, and you know, that's a little um, uh, trickier. And then the other key pieces, and, and again, I'll go through some of the stories here, is, is look at the pace at which they're advancing it. You know, if you're really confident about what you have, then you're going to move aggressively to push it, obviously, that's you know what we did with with Crawford and Canada Nickel early on. Um, you know, whereas if you're a little cautious and and maybe you're not sure what's really there, you're gonna again sort of you know every small step in the process, you're gonna put a press release out on it. Um, you're gonna do a dozen press releases before you actually put a drill hole in it. Um, you know, and then you're gonna have about three pre three press releases on that first drill hole before you then drill your second hole or as opposed to coming in there and go, okay, we've got this target. We're really confident. You know, we're doing 10 holes, hundred meters spacing across a kilometer, you know, and we think we're going to hit eight out of 10. Um, you know, th those are kind of the poles uh, again, to which to look to um, just to get some comfort as to, okay, you know, what's the probability that these guys are actually going to hit something. Yeah. So, yeah. Now in terms of results, so there's been a bunch of different bits. So Ardia, um, uh, uh, was known they've got a big Aussie laterite project, but they picked up a sulfide project. Uh, you know, again, assays like in many parts of the world are slow getting out. So lots of people are putting out more just a description of the mineralization as opposed to additional, as opposed to actual assay. So, you know, they, they, it, it was narrow as it, it was a couple meters, but a chunk of it was semi to massive sulfide, which generally should grade, you know, out, you know, anywhere from kind of one, percent plus nickel and then some disseminated matrix which should probably be around a percent so again you know if you if you get a hole in a new target that's got any kind of semi-massive to massive sulfides in it that's always a good good sign uh, then the next question after that is you know 
how thick is it and and over what extent are they able to drill it off but you know getting that first you know hole with a little bit of, of higher grade in there is always good uh bitterroot uh, company exploring in michigan um that's where the uh, eagle mine is uh, with lundine is in that same belt uh, again narrow um but getting um you know again it was you know a fraction of a meter but they you know did get a piece that was 2.7 percent nickel so you know again looks like it's got the potential um, you know, to have some higher grade there, obviously you're going to need, need much, much thicker than that to, um, to, to make it work. But you know, the system itself can generate those kinds of of of, uh, of, of nickel grades. Uh, Legend Mining um, has done some decent step outs on, on a target. So they basically were at the south and north end of a structure with some distance in between some of the stuff they'd been drilling before. Some of the other stuff had been relatively some pretty narrow step outs. These are you know, sort of, uh, um, you know, pretty courageous step outs for relative to the drilling they've been doing before. And it was good. You know, they've got several meters of semi-massive to massive sulfide, you know, in both of the holes. So uh, again, assays pending on that front, but it's good to get to see some lateral, lateral extent uh, that's there. Uh, and uh, another sort of from, from my side of the world, uh, you've got some, you know, Palladium 1 and Talon. Um, Palladium 1 um, hit uh, a zone near Thunder Bay. Um, new discovery, some nice high grade intervals from the first set of holes. Uh, again, in terms of drilling, this was one again, nice fence um, space. They drilled 14 holes, um, you know, over, you know, a good strike length uh, on the target. 11 of them hit massive or semi massive sulfides. Um, so, uh, again, pending, pending assays, but, you know, they gave some pictures of the core uh, and some. Again, not huge widths, um, but decent widths and 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 very good grades. So, um, you know, we'll see how they continue to to go. And again, that's a program that's you, they're doing with some confidence, um, which is good to see. Uh, Talon uh, has put out some more results uh, on. Again, they've got multiple targets they're working now, uh, and again, some good uh, lower grade intervals. You know, over 30, 40 meters of of width with. You know, containing again some good, you know, anywhere from two to two to five meters of multi percent, you know, three, four, five percent nickel, um, which is good to see, um, you know, with associated copper and cobalt. So, uh, again, so starting to see some good, good exploration um, results um, from some companies. And again, the pipeline in terms of new nickel targets and anomalies people are following, you know, that's, you know, that's one thing I've noticed there's been a big, big surge in that. Um, uh, you know, over over the last few months here, so busy, nice, nice numbers. I mean, some there's some um, names which just keep keep coming back. It's it's kind of nice to see the you know better companies are rising to the to the top as as it were. Um, just on um, production um, front, you know, so how are the big boys doing? To, you know, the the, the valets, the the, the Sherrits, the Glencores of this world, Norn Nickel, etc. Yeah, so obviously with the end of the quarter, you get to end up, and by the, uh, the the month after, you, you're getting production results from a bunch of the um, producers. Um, again, I think most sort of in line, I mean, we've talked about Norilsk and some of the issues that they had there. So, you know, their numbers were lower than expected. Um, you know, in general, you know, overall, um, you know, again, with the big disruption at Norilsk, um, you know, production from the existing producers was, was probably below uh, people's expectations. Uh, in general, there there was, you know, people were slightly over in line and in some cases slightly behind. I think one of the big one of the big gaps was uh, Connie Ambo. So that's, you know, that's in New Caledonia. So you've got Goro at one end, which is a HPAL project and is at, um, at the south end, which has now been sold. Uh, I, I'm sure Connie Ambo, you know, there was a lot of political disruption in New Caledonia um, that we talked about before. And so that may have played a role, but you know, their production in the quarter was only at a, a 12,000 ton per annum run rate versus 60,000 capacity. It's a farinical process. They they used a different process than the typical RKEF that you see in the in the uh, NPI plants in Indonesia, and you know, it's continued to to give them some grief. So I don't know whether this quarter was still more design issues or was more political issues or, or a mix of both, but. You know that, that that was a you know sort of a it's still a, a big miss so you know we'll see with the changing of the guard at Glencore um, you've had changes with Ivan Glazenberg leaving you've had um, you know some some of the the senior nickel people 
leave leave uh, Glencore. So you know we'll see whether Connie Ambo ends up you know similar to what we saw with with Goro maybe getting sold uh, to somebody. I, again, I don't know anything at this point, but uh, you know I, I think it'll be interesting to see what's happening with this asset because again it struggled for close to a decade and probably seen ten to fifteen billion dollars of capital in total uh, pumped into it. Wow. So insane. And what about Sherrod? What's the story there? Yeah, Sherrod did really well. Um, Cuba, you know, sort of ahead of, ahead of production. Uh, you know, they are, um, you know, nice amount of, of nickel and cobalt coming out of there. And again, there's very few pure, you know, pure nickel plays uh, in the market. So uh, that are produ- you know, production stage companies. So it's good to see some of the pure play uh, nickel producers um, uh, doing well. Uh, you know, w- one thing on that front, which was encouraging, we kind of mentioned it last week, but it's starting to, you know, there was, it was brought up on the valet conference call is, you know, they are really looking at spinning out their um, base, you know, their, their nickel, nickel and or base metals business, you know, as a standalone business. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've, they've floated that a few times when they first acquired the asset, they were looking to kind of repackage their assets and spin it back out again, fairly quickly post, um, post merger. Uh, and then again, the idea was floated around 2014 to 2015. Uh, and so uh, I, I really hope it happens, um, you know, for, for, for one key reason, um, you know, it's, it is much easier to get investors to look at um, a commodity when they've got some very large liquid names that they can do their research on nickel. They know they can spend a lot of capital on um on, on, on the big, large liquid names. And then, it, you know, the, if they want to, they can look at some smaller investments around the edges to give themselves a little more torque. If you don't have that big core anchor investment, then, you know, the investable universe is just too small. And, and people just say, look at, I'm not, I'm not spending time on that commodity. There's not a large enough investable universe to make it worth my while. So, you know, we, we've got some, you know, with Nickel Mines being coming a multi-billion dollar company, um, you know, that's been helpful. But, you know, the reality is, is, you know, most of the pure pl- large pure play nickel producers are all in higher risk jurisdictions. So you've got Norilsk um, with Russia, you've got Nickel Mines with, with Indonesia, and you've got Sherrod with, with Cuba. So, you know, having someone who's got, uh, you know, is, will be, be a largely or high nickel torque name um, that's in a lower political risk jurisdiction will will fill a hole in the investment landscape which should help you know all uh, nickel companies um, you know attract more investment brilliant in fact I'm, I'm, I, we um, was it, I think next Thursday got Andy home coming on okay be interesting to see what yeah. he has to say I mean good guy yeah oh no no very good guy you know it does, has a great column and, and he had an interesting column this past week uh, you know, we're really highlighted sort of, you know, Indonesia as, as the big question in the nickel market, you know, and, and again, you can construct Indonesia scenarios where it creates, you know, multi-year surpluses in the nickel market and the world won't need another pound. Or you can also construct Indonesian scenarios where, yeah, we're going to be desperately short of nickel. And, you know, where is, is the Western world really going to depend on Indonesia for their nickel? So he did a very good job, I think, sort of highlighting sort of the, <laughs> the giant question marks hanging over the industry industry right now um, going forward. So, no, I'm sure you'll have a very good discussion with him on nickel and uh, the other commodities at this point in the cycle. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I hope so. I hope so. And it's usually a good conversation, which is far ranging, but, you know, he's very, very knowledgeable. Um, this is Andy Holmes, uh, Reuters senior correspondent here in London, uh, or senior metals correspondent, I should say. Um, some good stuff. In fact, if you don't follow him, do you follow some of his, his Twitter commentary or, or try and find us? Stuff online, it's, it's really good. Um, wow, okay, well, that, that, there's, there's a romp through. Yeah. Busy old play. Hey, gotta ask, it's the, what is it today, Tom? Fifth? Fifth. Fifth. What happens on the 20th, Tom? The Met Sock. No. What? What's this guy gotta got do on the 20th? Oh, the P E A, Tom. Uh, yes. Mark, how's it going? Tom. Good. Yeah, I know. It's good. You know, obviously head down, getting uh, all the last little bits together here. But, uh, you know, uh, again, we're, you know, 
quite happy with where everything's coming out and uh, very much looking forward to, you know, um, you know, helping investors get the kind of metrics in terms of what these larger, lower grade deposits could look like. Again, I'm pointing people to the Dumont Nickel website and the feasibility study that was done there to get some idea that's there. But again, you know, you need to put it on your project to really uh, to, to be able to see what's there. So i um, very, very glad to be getting to this stage. And then again, pivoting right into kicking off our feasibility study work um, to try and get that done as quickly as possible after uh, this PEA is done and put to bed. Beautiful. It's like, it's not a competition, but will your PEA be better than the Dumont one? It's not a competition. It's, a, you know, it's, it's not a competition. No, we'll, we'll uh, stay tuned. Stay tuned. <laughs> You didn't fall for that? That was like, that was so subtle. So subtle. I, I, you didn't fall for no. it? No. Can't, can't do that at this point. No. I just, you know, I gotta try though. I gotta try. Anyway, well, um, it's only, it's, it's only midweek. Yeah. You, you'll be busy. I guess you've got a lot to do between now and then, obviously. Are you getting any downtime? Uh, not so much because the other big thing we were working on together is the, 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 the nickel conference in two weeks. So, you know, um, this is the first in a value chain series that uh, CIM and Metsoc is going to be pushing to help investors understand, you know, what yeah. they need to know about certain commodities so they can make better investment decisions and, and hopefully, uh, you know, lose a little less money on, on the losers and make a little more money and, and uh, hopefully have some tools and be able to ask the right questions on, on how to pick more winners than losers going forward. So I think yeah. it's coming together pretty nicely. We've got some good set of speakers. So. Yeah, good. I think you got the right balance between the, the the technical stuff that you, you know some people like to know, try and try and understand yeah. at least, and the how do I make money bet, which is yeah. which is good. Or how do I not lose money, and then how do I make money? That I think it, it'll be good. I'm really I'm really so pleased with the people you put together. It's yeah, it's nice great. Really nice. Yeah, group. no, it's come together really well. So okay, glad to be helping out. Nineteenth and twentieth of May. Got it all lined up. We'll be putting uh, various marketing pieces around, uh, everywhere. Um, if, well, we started already, haven't we? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mark, appreciate your time this week. Um, I'll see you next week for the usual. We might have to take a, a break the week of Metsoc. I think You're going to be should. exhausted. Yes. Yep. The conference yep. we'll and the that PEA. Week. And goodness yep. knows what else you do. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. We'll catch you next week, Mark. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Matthew.